In this video, I'll be discussing some general principles of how to examine patients. These are the behaviors that a clinician should demonstrate irrespective of how complex or brief the exam will be. I'll discuss how to optimize the environment, how to communicate effectively and respectfully during the exam, how to promote patient comfort, including a demonstration of draping for different parts of the exam, and I'll end with general points regarding the examination of patients with obesity and of those with a disability. But first, there is one consideration that transcends all of the others. When performing the physical exam, it's essential to consider cultural factors and how they might impact what your patient sees as appropriate and respectful. I'm an American doctor who practices adult medicine in an American hospital. That's the perspective that I bring to this video and to this course overall. While I believe the vast majority of what I'll be saying today is applicable throughout the world, specific recommendations might differ for some places and within some cultures and within some contexts. Before the exam even begins, you need to optimize the environment. What's necessary to achieve this will depend on the content of the exam you'll be performing, and you may be limited by the setting. Examining a patient in a crowded, noisy ER is a very different experience than doing so in a quiet, relatively spacious outpatient clinic. For both patient privacy and to reduce distractions, the door to the room should be closed if safe and feasible to do so. If there's more than one patient in the room and it's not practical to temporarily relocate either patient, ensure that the person you are examining is fully surrounded by curtains. That may seem obvious, but in a busy hospital environment, it is surprisingly easy to overlook. Ensure that the room is properly lit. It's common in American hospitals to have three major light sources, the window, a relatively dim light attached to the wall at the head of the bed, and a relatively bright light on the ceiling above the bed. In the absence of patient photophobia, that is pain in the eyes in bright light, you should always examine the patient with the overhead light on. Whether in the hospital or in clinic, raise the exam table or bed to a height that is comfortable for you as the examiner. You should neither be on your tiptoes nor hunched over during any part of the exam. Just be sure to lower the bed or exam table to a safe position after the exam is completed. For any exam of the body that includes regions below the neck and above the ankle, it is preferable for the patient to be in a medical gown with the opening in the back. An exception to this would be if performing only a breast exam, in which case the gown opening would typically be in the front with a sheet across the patient's lap. Regarding what undergarments should stay on underneath the gown, it also depends on the maneuvers to be performed. If cardiac, pulmonary, and or abdominal exams are to be performed, it is optimal from the examiner's perspective for women and others with breasts to not be wearing a bra. However, if a patient feels more comfortable with it left on, it is not the end of the world. Most maneuvers can still be reasonably performed with the very notable exception of a breast exam. Regarding other underwear under the gown, for most exams, it stays on, with pelvic, GU, and rectal exams being the obvious exceptions. Sanitize your hands immediately before the exam, even if you already did so upon initially entering the room. Also re-sanitize your hands whenever you've touched your own face and after you've examined the patient's feet. Regarding the routine use of face masks during patient encounters, this is a whole discussion about which some people have very strong opinions. In extreme brief, you should follow local guidance from your public health department and clinical supervisor, but in situations where the, where the decision seems ambiguous, err on the side of wearing a mask, especially if the patient themselves is wearing one, and definitely if the patient is immunocompromised or presenting with respiratory symptoms. Now, I won't be wearing a mask in this video series because it's more difficult to effectively communicate in video form with one on, and because the actors and actresses I'll be working with are all healthy and they've been hired with the specific understanding that we won't be wearing masks during filming. However, when I'm seeing actual patients in the hospital, 
for now in fall of 2023, I do still wear one for all encounters. Some clinical trainees wonder about the routine use of gloves during the exam. Certainly, gloves are required if examining a region of broken skin, anything in the pelvic or perirectal region, or if there is any concern for a contagious disease that spread through skin contact. Beyond this, however, when gloves are worn is a matter of personal preference and local culture. Personally, aside from the aforementioned situations, I otherwise only wear gloves during the exam when examining the axillae, uh, the inguinal regions, or when the patient has a unusually severe problem with hygiene. It's very uncommon for a clinician in America to wear gloves for the entire exam, and some experienced clinicians strongly object to doing so. Personally, I think it's okay if others have a different threshold for wearing gloves than I do, as long as they realize that gloves for the entire exam do create a subtle barrier between doctor and patient that goes beyond the thin layer of nitrile rubber. One last issue with optimizing the environment, one very dependent on local culture and practice, is deciding whether or not a chaperone should be present. In this context, a chaperone is a third party, either the patient's family member or a member of the medical uh, team, typically one of the same gender as the patient, who is present in the room during the exam for the primary purpose of ensuring there is no sexually inappropriate physical contact or language. In my opinion, any pelvic, GU, or rectal exam requires a staff chaperone, uh, irrespective of the genders of examiner and patient. And either a staff or family chaperone should be present for any exam if the patient requests it. I would also recommend either a staff or family chaperone be present when a man is performing a breast exam. However, beyond these scenarios, it's hard to, pro to provide any rules of thumb other than our, our decision on a chaperone must balance respect for our patients and their preferences, protection for ourselves, and the realities of what can be practically offered in a particular clinical environment. Clear and respectful communication during the exam is critical for clinician-patient rapport, as well as for facilitating the actual maneuvers themselves. Although this can take hundreds of patient encounters before a student feels fully comfortable with this, Success comes down to only several basic principles. Explain what you're going to do before you do it, not as you are doing it. Avoid technical jargon. Although a relatively small thing, avoid giving explanations while standing behind the patient where they can't see you. Consider briefly explaining the purpose of exam maneuvers that might seem unusual to the patient. For example, when I examine the JVP, I will often tell patients that clinicians can estimate the pressures inside the heart by looking at the veins in their necks. But you do not need to go overboard with explaining the purpose behind every single maneuver. Provide incremental feedback along the way by letting the patient know things are normal. But I do also occasionally see students overdo this. How do you strike the right balance? Typically let patients know their blood pressure uh, immediately after measuring it, uh, I find that uh, patients are particularly interested in that one value, um, if it happens to be part of the exam. Um, and for th after that, summarize findings no more than once after each large exam section. Also use the terms normal or healthy rather than good or great to describe your observations. While it might not seem like an issue to tell a patient their lungs sounded great, if you make it a habit to only use normal or healthy, then you'll never have the misfortune of accidentally telling a patient that their breast or rectal exam was great. Lastly, it's common and even helpful to ask focused review of systems questions during the exam, but if you do so, be sure to ask them before examining the relevant body part. For example, if you ask them if they've ever had diarrhea, after you've palpated their abdomen, they're going to get really nervous about what it was you felt. During the actual exam, you'll need to constantly consider your patient's comfort, though not to such an extreme as to compromise the accuracy or thoroughness of the exam. For a healthy, asymptomatic patient, 
no part of the physical exam should be literally painful. But for patients with symptomatic disease, you may need to perform maneuvers which elicit or exacerbate pre-existing pain. As long as what you are doing is diagnostically helpful, and as long as you explain it to the patient who consents to it, it is okay to cause brief physical discomfort during the exam. When it comes to the exam sequence and flow, unless the patient is a healthcare professional themselves, they will neither know nor care about the proper order. Therefore, use an order that makes logical sense to you and which minimizes the chance that you forget something. And if midway through the exam, you happen to remember a maneuver that ideally or optimally you should have done earlier, just go back to it. Trust me, the patient, they will not notice. The only other rule about the exam sequence is that you should try to minimize the number of times the patient needs to move positions. So ideally, all maneuvers for which the patient needs to be supine should be done at the same time, and I should, you know, all maneuvers that require the patient to be standing up. Now let's discuss the practicalities of draping patients and adjusting their gown during the exam. In order for the exam to be as useful and accurate as possible, you do need to expose what needs to be examined, but no more than this. In other words, if a part of the body that is usually covered is not actively being examined, it should be covered at that particular time. As you adjust what's covered and not covered, you should be the one who moves the sheet or drape, while the patient is the one who moves their own gown. If you ever do need to move the gown yourself, always explain what you'd like to do before you do it, rather than as you're doing it. Let me demonstrate some specific draping and gowning techniques. In all of these, you should start with a sheet laying across the patient's lap. This provides some extra modesty, and it also leaves it within reach when it becomes more necessary. The posterior chest exam is the same in all genders. Explain what you are planning to do, and offer to untie the gown behind the neck for the patient, since it may be hard for them to reach. Ask the patient to cross their arms and hold their opposite shoulders. This helps to prevent the gown from falling off the shoulder, and unnecessarily exposing their anterior chest. In this position, you can then inspect, percuss, and auscultate the posterior lungs. If a bra is present, simply examine around it. Some examiners will also ask the patient to place their hands on their hips when auscultating in the mid-axillary line. To examine the anterior chest in a man, either sitting or supine, simply ask him to lower his gown to his waist. Once completed, ask him to raise the gown back to his shoulders and ask if he would like assistance retying it. Examination of the anterior chest in a woman and in others with breasts. This is best done in a supine or semi-supine position. This limits the likelihood of a gowning mishap. The sheet should be fully across their lap and legs. If using a conventional exam table, extend the leg rest. When examining the upper chest, including the lung apices, clavicles, and upper cardiac auscultation, ask the patient to lower their gown to several inches below their collarbone or to the level of their upper breasts. When you switch to examining the lower chest, first ask them to raise their gown back to their shoulders. Then while you stand below their waist, lift the sheet and ask them to lift their gown to their bra line or to just underneath their breasts. Replace the sheet such that only the upper abdomen is exposed at this point. Depending on how high they lifted the gown, you may need to slide your stethoscope under the gown to auscultate some areas. To aid in the auscultation at the cardiac apex, you may need to ask the patient to lift their breast upwards. Do not lift their breast for them. And do not attempt to listen to the cardiac apex through the breast tissue. When it's time to examine the abdomen, Ask if you can lower the sheet to the hips. If the lower abdomen or inguinal regions are not sufficiently exposed due to the patient's underwear, it's okay to ask your patient to further lower their underwear to the extent needed, but once again, avoid doing this yourself. Proper draping for the breast, pelvic, GU, and rectal exams 
is slightly more complicated, but follow the same general principles of exposing only what's necessary, only for as long as necessary. I'll end this video by discussing necessary considerations in two specific patient populations. The first is patients who are severely obese. Many physical exam findings, particularly within the cardiovascular, pulmonary, and abdominal exams, have reduced negative predictive values compared to non-obese patients. In other words, it's more difficult to identify findings such as abnormal heart and lung sounds or to palpate abdominal masses when there is more adipose tissue present. However, the clinician should still perform the exam maneuvers they otherwise would, but they may need to shift how they interpret the absence of a finding. As just one example of what I'm talking about, in patients with a normal body habitus, the absence of a heart murmur alone more or less rules out hemodynamically significant or severe aortic stenosis. That is not true in severely obese patients. The second population is patients with a disability. In short, the examiner should be respectful and considerate of a disabled patient's comfort during the exam. But that does not mean truncating the exam because you don't know how to work around or work with their disability for an indicated maneuver. If you would examine a part of the body in an able-bodied patient with the same symptoms, you should do so for a patient with a disability. If you're not sure how that's going to work, explain to the patient what you would like to examine and why, and ask the patient if that would be possible and what the best approach would be. For example, performing an abdominal or back exam in a quadriplegic patient who is sitting in a motorized wheelchair. That kind of exam should not be attempted with a patient still in the wheelchair, if at all possible. Sometimes you need to get a little creative. Just because a patient is blind doesn't mean that you can't test their coordination, despite the fact that it's usually done by asking the patient to mimic emotion that you're doing yourself. And just because a patient is deaf does not make an assessment of language skills any less relevant. If you need to perform a relatively common maneuver in such situations, sometimes the patients themselves may have suggestions from previous exams they've received. That concludes this video on general principles of the physical exam. Subsequent videos in this series will demonstrate and discuss specific maneuvers with examples of common findings.